Hello everyone, I am LilyMoo961 and well, I have some explaining to do because the review for Frostbite was posted on May 4th, 2020 and I am recording this on June 17th, 2021. Yeah, let that sink in. That is a substantial gap of time. <laughs> And some of you may be wondering why this happened, and the rest of you lovely viewers are probably just like, we don't care, just get to the review now that you're here. <laughs> However, I have every intention of explaining exactly what happened for the simple fact that it ties into the plot of this expertly crafted story. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, today we are finally going to tackle Shadow Kiss, the third installment of the Vampire Academy series by Rochelle Mead. Now before jumping into the explanation for why I was gone so long, let's explain the general plot of Shadow Kiss. Of course, in order to do that, I have to spoil the ending to Frostbite within the next few seconds. So if you haven't read it by now, well, you're fresh out of luck, aren't you? In the final chapters of Frostbite, Rose, Christian, Mason, his best friend Eddie, and Mia are captured by some Strigoi, which if you remember, are the evil, scary vampires. Eventually, this not-so-merry band of teens manage to escape their holding cell thanks to some quick thinking from Rose and Christian, but in the midst of the fray that follows, Rose stays behind to act as a distraction so everyone else can get to safety outside into the sun where these evil vampires cannot venture. But while Rose is doing this, Mason doubles back to save her, and one Strigoi catches him in a headlock and breaks his neck, killing him instantly. Rose immediately spirals into a rage, and with some help from Mia's water magic, she decapitates the two Strigoi with a worn, rusty sword. Shadow Kiss begins a few weeks after this traumatic event. Rose is gearing up for a six-week Guardian Field Experience examination, in which she and other dampers will be tested on their ability to efficiently guard Moroi from Strigoi. Rose believes this task will be simple since she has killed two Strigoi recently, but things never play out in a simple manner for this girl. Not only is she paired up with Christian rather than Lisa for this field experience, but she's seen what appears to be Mason's ghost on campus. <laughs> At the same time, Rose learns troubling information concerning Victor Dashkov, the antagonist of the first book. He is about to go on trial for his crimes against Lisa at the Royal Moroi Court, but the main witnesses to his crimes, which include Lisa, Rose, and Christian, will not have the chance to testify because Tatiana, Queen of the Moroi, deemed it unnecessary. <sighs> and trust me, we will chat about her buffoonery in a few minutes. But the main thing I want to stress about Shadow Kiss at this particular time is that it is completely different in structure than the first two books in the series. The first Vampire Academy book can be described as inciting incident and world building, the novel. The second plays out like a Yoko Taro plotline in which you gain some added context for the world, followed by a shocking smack to the feels practically out of nowhere. This third book, though, is more of an elaborate concoction of mounting tension. The general atmosphere of Rose's narration has changed tremendously in the wake of Mason's death and subsequent reappearance as a ghost that only she can see. And so from the instant Rose encounters his lingering spirit, an eerie shadow of dread begins to loom over the entire narrative. And on top of all that, this plot meanders. I don't know what it is about the third book in series and meandering plot lines, but that's just what they do apparently. However, in the case of Shadow Kiss, the meandering, though it seems aimless initially, serves to build tension and connect different themes of the story together. It's extremely effective and subtle, especially at the beginning. These mini arcs within the plot are not only interesting, but transition into one another in a very natural fashion, so it really does feel as if you are going through the life of a real person rather than a character. Some things happen in a sporadic or chaotic fashion, in the same way situations occur in day-to-day -day life, and that's a nice touch. But I do caution all of you to pay very close attention to every last detail presented within this winding road of a plot because once the meandering stops, the pain and tears start. And that's not a joke, seriously. The pain and the tears, the stress, everything starts happening once the meandering quits. So be glad for the meandering while it's there, okay? That's all I need to say about that. 
This is one of those books that's extremely difficult to review because there's just so much to unpack in terms of the plot, the characters, and all of the different themes that are presented. Shadow Kiss is also the longest book in the series thus far, and that adds its own challenges in terms of reviewing it because there's just a lot more detail to look into. And I also didn't take notes while reading this book, so the only way I can review this adequately is to discuss it by each mini arc that we see within the story. And those arcs are as follows. The Field Experience arc, the Morroy Court arc, the Insanity of Romance arc, and lastly, the Never Ending Stress arc. <sighs> Cause Lord, the stress, the stress. I will do the best I can not to go into spoiler territory within these sections, and I feel pretty confident there'll only be some minor stuff within the first two sections that we're gonna cover, but once we get to that third arc, things might get a little sketchy in the spoiler department, so just proceed with caution throughout this review because I am kind of giving an overview of what happens throughout the story. So while I don't intend for there to be any big, major spoilers, there may be one or two that just end up happening. In addition to this, one thing I need to make clear about this review is that it is going to get heavy and personal at points. Aspect of this plot hit home in the grief department for me, so if you have personally lost someone close to you within the last year due to either the pandemic or other things, uh, just pace yourself with this review. There's going to be a lot of talk of death and loss and grief and if it's still really fresh for you, uh, maybe wait a little while before watching this review or even reading this book because it does get a little heavy at points. With that said, let us begin. This part of Shadow Kiss essentially drops hints for the arcs to follow in the vaguest way possible. And for me, this section is the weakest of this particular book. That's not to say it's bad, far from it, but it's definitely the slowest in pacing and lacks some of the intrigue you would expect to get at the beginning of a novel. If you're reading this book immediately after the first two, the slower pacing at the beginning is really apparent and a touch annoying. When I made my first attempt to read this book back in May 2020, this is the section where I stopped reading. In particular, I stopped at chapter 5. This chapter covers what happens after Rose's second Mason sighting in which she freezes up during her first field exam. In chapter 5, the Guardians running the evaluation basically assume the worst about Rose and can't believe that she would freeze up in a fight after killing two Strigoi. On some level, I get why this happens. Rose throws a tantrum about getting paired with Christian rather than Lisa and says something stupid about the teachers regretting this choice later. But here's the thing. Christian was one of the Moroi she saved during the whole Spokane Strigoi incident. She protected him then when he was in actual legitimate danger. Even if she doesn't like Christian all that much, the Guardians should know, based on her recent past, that she wouldn't just abandon Christian to Strigoi or get revenge about the pair up in a way that would put her future at risk. Though still in training, Rose takes her future duty as a Guardian very seriously. She has shown over and over again that despite her bad reputation, she is dedicated to the cause of fighting Strigoi and protecting Moroi, especially Lisa. And since Christian and Lisa are dating, Rose would never put him in danger on purpose and to a lesser extent bail on him during an examination where she's being tested on whether or not she can guard Moroi other than Lisa. The Guardians, excluding Dimitri, all see the worst in Rose and are ready to take her out of this exam without considering the idea that she might be, oh I don't know, traumatized! 
They completely forget that she's still only 17. And later on in the book, we find out that these people never thought to provide therapy for Rose or anyone else involved in the Spokane incident where a fellow classmate died. They also forget that this particular classmate was someone Rose was close to and the fact he was killed right in front of her. And again, Christian was there too. She's already protected him before. What would be the point in her deciding she hates the guy enough to jeopardize her hopes in becoming Lisa's guardian after graduation? Sure, Rose has a rebellious streak, but not to this extent, like, come on, come on. This absolutely drove me crazy. Dimitri is the only person in this situation with the Guardians to believe in her innocence and vouch for her to continue the field experience. He is also the only person to really ask Rose if she's okay after what happened with Mason to begin with. And one thing good this chapter does establish is that Rose and Dimitri's bond is built on a foundation of mutual understanding and friendship because the two of them are very similar in how they handle personal problems. So at this particular point, Dimitri tries to reach out to Rose, but she doesn't tell him or anyone else the reason why she froze during the exam. In May of 2020, this also drove me crazy because dang it woman, just tell Dimitri what's going on. Now, while this chapter is what made me stop reading for a bit, it's not what kept me from coming back to the book. More on that later. But one other thing I want to mention about this section is that even Lisa assumes Rose didn't defend Christian on purpose. More on that later too, put a pin in that. The only other thing of note in this particular section is that we meet a character named Jill. She is a younger Moroi who idolizes Rose and wants to learn how to fight. She is going to be an important character in future books, but for now, all she really does is provide Rose with some information about Moroi coming to class beaten up. And for some reason, the teachers aren't making a big deal out of this. Suspicious. I would suggest putting a pin in that too. In Frostbite, we find out that Adrian is a spirit user like Lisa. At the beginning of Shadow Kiss, we find out that he's staying at the Academy to help her control spirit better and learn a few new tricks himself. He has a crush on Rose, so he periodically shows up in her dreams to flirt with her. Rose disapproves of this, but in one of these dreams, she and Adrian have a discussion about her feelings for Dimitri. Adrian mainly just makes a point along the lines of, Belikov is not as invincible as you think. In The Waking World, Rose responds to this by begging and pleading for Dimitri to get her and Lisa to the Moroi court so the two of them can testify against Victor Dashkove at his upcoming trial. In the very first Vampire Academy book, Victor kidnapped Lisa, tortured her into using spirit powers to heal him from his disease, and cast a charm on Rose and Dimitri to force them into a makeout session as a means of distracting them from saving Lisa. Even though he was caught and has been in prison for a bit, there is potential for him to be released since he is part of one of the royal Moroi families. Rose, Lisa, and Christian are all concerned about this outcome and they want to make sure Victor stays locked up. Unfortunately, Dimitri doesn't have the power to make it so they can testify. Rose gets upset about this because she truly believes Dimitri can do just about anything. A few days later though, they're off to Moroi Court because Adrian managed to pull some strings and get them the permission they needed to testify. The main reason Adrian was able to do this is because Queen Tatiana is his aunt. Gotta love those family connections. However, there are problems right from the start. Victor goes out of his way to send Rose a letter once she's on the grounds of the royal court, which prompts her and Dimitri to pay him a visit to his cell before the trial. Victor knows the most about spirit and its potential, so discussion of ghosts comes up since Rose is becoming increasingly concerned about the constant Mason sightings. But this discussion comes to a screeching halt once Victor threatens to spill the beans on Rose and Dimitri's relationship, which definitely causes some tension to arise on the actual court day. Although to be fair, Victor, they would have never made out in the first place if, oh, I don't know, you didn't put a charm on them. Yeah, and then they wouldn't have this debacle that's been going on since book one. Anyway, without going into detail about what happens, this is the section where we start to see traces of Rose's resentment of her role within Moroi society, especially when Queen Tatiana assumes she's having an affair with Adrian after witnessing a brief side hug between them. It's another one of those, where is the logic moments. 
but the queen basically threatens Rose while calling her a whole host of derogatory names. Now this lady is certainly unpleasant to deal with, but I'm not really gonna rant about her too much at this point. The only thing I really need to say is that she's making her vindictive motives far too obvious, and all I can think is, there's definitely foul play in your rise to power because you don't have a logical or diplomatic bone in your body. I don't outright hate the lady, yet, but I'm sure I will in the books to come. At any rate, Rose starts feeling like she's expendable, and due to her lackluster performance on the field experience test so far, she feels like she could be replaced as Lisa's guardian despite the spiritual bond they share. It's something that worries her, but this particular arc showcases how the two girls are on the road towards different paths. Lisa, though still timid at times, has a commanding presence and is perfectly capable of voicing her views on Moroi society. There's unrest brewing between royal and non-royal Moroi concerning whether or not Moroi should fight Strigoi alongside the Damper Guardians, which are dwindling in number. Lisa's beliefs on this and other Moroi issues are in opposition to Queen Tatiana's views. As the last Dragomir princess, Lisa will inevitably find herself embroiled in the politics of the court because her own desire to enact change and live up to the legacy of her family name. Rose is someone who has always felt the need for attention to some extent. She likes standing out. In many ways, she's a normal girl who likes to dance, crack jokes, hang out with friends, and dress up every now and again. But Lisa is the princess. She's the one who gets to be beautiful, while Rose has to sacrifice the simple pleasures of her teen years to training and discipline. Even though she prides herself on her battle prowess, the role she's training for is contrary to her core personality. And within this arc, we start to see some of the life seep out of Rose due to her own realizations about what it means to be a guardian. Guardians fight Strigoi. Many of them die in battle. Many more Roy simply see them as tools for protection and nothing more. Rose has lived her whole life by the guardian mantra, they come first. And unfortunately, though Lisa values and treasures Rose, she doesn't quite understand the changes that she's going through. She certainly understands grief, having lost her parents and brother in a car crash before the events of the first novel, but Rose's situation is just different. It's one thing to lose people you love in an accident, and another to see someone you love murdered before your eyes the way Rose does. The best example of what I mean happens shortly after Queen Tatiana has her little talk with Rose. Lisa meets up with her and takes her to a spa to relax. Sounds like some good quality girl fun. Rose gets a manicure because she wants to feel beautiful in some way before resigning herself to a role where beautification of any kind is simply impractical. Once those manicures are done, Lisa makes arrangements for the queen's personal masseuse and secret lover to massage her feet and is essentially congratulating herself for a job well done without a clue as to what's going on in Rose's head as she sits there getting a foot massage from a guy sleeping with the queen that just accused and threatened her. Ay ay ay. And that's not even the worst of Lisa's blunders. Later on in the third arc, Lisa tries to talk Eddie, Mason's best friend, into trying to date Rose. By that point, Mason has only been dead for about a month, and he was the last person Rose dated. Even without the whole ghost thing, Lisa, what makes you think Rose is ready to date right now when her last boyfriend isn't even cold in the ground yet? And to pose this idea of dating Rose to Mason's best friend on top of that, what are you thinking? Is no one using their brains in this book aside from Rose and Dimitri? Did they pull a Bonnie and Clyde and just steal the intelligence from everyone else? Like seriously, this is getting ridiculous. Lisa means well, she truly does, but this example and others show that she doesn't really know Rose anymore. The two of them haven't been able to spend much time together since she started dating Christian, and after Mason died, they were together even less. We still get to see some events from Lisa's perspective due to the spiritual bond Rose shares with her, but at this point, Lisa has no real insight on what's going on with Rose at all. Even in the first arc, she assumes the worst about Rose in regards to Christian and the field exam. Like it or not, that says a lot about where their friendship stands. Though not a strained or bitter transition by any means, the simple truth is that Rose and Lisa are growing apart. Lisa has gained confidence in the course of these books, but these changes to her character aren't all that substantial. Rose, on the other hand, has transformed from a sassy, rebellious guardian in training 
to a more serious and dependable iteration of herself, yet everyone, except Dimitri more or less, automatically assumes the worst about her actions in nearly every scenario. Lisa was never one of them, until now. Christian believes in Rose more than Lisa at this point, and that's saying something given the rocky start to their friendship. But thankfully, Rose does have someone she can actually rely on. This arc begins on the way back to the Academy from Moroi Court. On the plane, Rose gets a headache, and when the plane takes an unexpected stop, Rose suddenly sees around 50 ghosts, screams at them to go away, and experiences pain so severe that she passes out. When she wakes up, she's in the nurse's office of the Academy, and when prompted by Dimitri, finally breaks down and tells him she's been seeing ghosts, mainly Mason. Now this third arc in the book is easily the best one. It is a page turner in many respects and for many different reasons, but what I love the most about this section and the whole book really is the deep dive into Rose's psyche and how her bond with Dimitri grows. Despite how insane Rose's explanations about what's happening to her seem to him, he listens, he doesn't degrade her, he helps her work through her theories, and he becomes the safest person for her to confide in. I'm well aware that the age gap between Dimitri and Rose makes their relationship sketchy on the surface, especially since Dimitri is her instructor and should have transferred to another job long before now, but their moments together rarely place emphasis on romance. The emphasis is placed on things like general companionship, camaraderie, friendship, mutual trust, and mutual respect. On top of all that, this isn't a normal school in our society. Dampers like Rose are half vampires, and most of them are raised with the mentality that their lives are entirely expendable because protecting the Moroi, royal Moroi in particular, comes first. They are placed in academies, just like the one Rose attends, and when they graduate, they become soldiers for the Moroi. They're on the front lines when Strigoi attack, and many of them die. The life of one of Rose's closest friends, who was also training to be a guardian, is cut short right in front of her, without warning. Someone she loves is gone, and she's had virtually no time to process this. As a result, she feels the need to close herself off from nearly everyone. Dimitri has also closed himself off from relationships that go beyond general friendliness and professionalism up until meeting Rose. He is someone who has killed Strigoi, and he has witnessed the deaths of comrades too. And out of everyone who knows Rose, he understands her the best because they think alike in many ways. And to add the cherry on top, he is one of the only people to look beyond Rose's bad reputation and wild rebellious streak to see who she really is as a person without any judgment or malice. By the time we get to this point in Shadow Kiss, Rose has matured enough to see him in the exact same manner. And this type of bond between people is something incredibly precious and rare. Yes, the teacher-student plotline is sketchy, but nothing about Dimitri's end of the relationship is manipulative or creepy. He is duty-bound to a fault. It hurts him to lie on the stand to his fellow guardians at Moray Court about where he and Rose were before tracking down Lisa in the first book, but he does so to protect Rose and ensure she has a good future. He doesn't bat an eyelash at the potential cost to himself. Plus, most of their scenes together are just really pure and wholesome. Even though they're attracted to each other, Rochelle Mead goes out of her way to show that this is not the core of their bond. In other YA stories, love usually boils down to physical attraction and nothing more. Characters end up together despite not having much in common, or any chemistry, or any real respect for one another. And then you have Dimitri and Rose, where the vast majority of their screen time together showcases love through simple and quiet moments where they just talk or sit in comfortable silence. But this is about to change. Within this arc, Lisa encounters a horrible situation with some Moroi royals and ends up using her powers in a really destructive way as a result. When Rose reaches her, Lisa is on the brink of madness. By this point, Rose has discovered that she's been absorbing the dark side effects of spirit from Lisa, and so she begs her friend to send those negative emotions to her. She does, and then Rose is the one flipping out. Dimitri and other guardians arrive on the scene, and he is the one to take her away so she can cool down. Only she won't. She can't. Lisa's negative emotions are overwhelming her own, and all she can think about is killing the person who hurt Lisa. 
And it's in this moment where Dimitri is trying to restrain her that we see legitimate vulnerability from him. He is absolutely terrified of what's happening to Rose and has been for a while. Even though he's done his best to be there for her, he's truly frightened that he's going to lose her to whatever evil is taking hold, and so he is begging for her to snap out of it. Rose even realizes that she isn't herself while he's pleading with her, but she isn't able to immediately overcome the rage. But then he says her name. It was only my name, but it was so powerful, filled with so much. Dimitri had such absolute faith in me, faith in my own strength and goodness, and he had strength too, a strength I could see he wasn't afraid to lend me if I needed it. Deirdre might have been onto something about me resenting Lisa, but she was completely off about Dimitri. What we had was love. We were like two halves of a whole, always ready to support the other. Neither of us was perfect, but that didn't matter. With him, I could defeat this rage that filled me. He believed I was stronger than it, and I was. I feel that this quote is one of the better examples of what I mean when I say that this bond isn't built on physical attraction, because real love has very little to do with that. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. Rose always had the ability to break past the rage, but Dimitri's belief in her strength helped her to see that truth for herself. I firmly believe that what these two have is legitimate love, but it's legitimate love at the wrong time in their lives. Even so, I give them both credit for fighting against their feelings for as long as they could. I don't condone what happens between them later, especially because they both knew it was wrong beforehand, but even the strongest and most noble people can fall to temptation when at their breaking point. It happens. And in the end, all I can do is just admit that I absolutely adore these two together. I can't help it. I love it. I love them together. Despite the age difference, despite the horrible teacher-student thing, I love them together because the bond they share is truly beautiful. Although I will admit that I may be a little bit biased because this bond that Dimitri and Rose have reminds me of the bond I used to share with a really close friend of mine who unfortunately passed away suddenly due to a seizure in September 2020. He showed me what true friendship and love were, and that's something that I will never forget for as long as I live. And seeing it here in this novel was extremely cathartic yet heartbreaking for me, because the second Rose is at her happiest, the world around her slips into chaos yet again. After leaving the scene of their passionate affair, Rose and Dimitri walk hand in hand through the woods on the way back to the campus. However, before they can reach it, Rose spots Mason's ghost again, and this time he's there to warn her of impending danger. Truth is, that was his whole purpose for showing up all those different times. You see, Rose didn't see any ghosts while in Moroy Court, where there are protective wards everywhere, but she saw a multitude of ghosts when their plane made an unexpected stop in an area without any protective wards. The Academy has wards, so Rose should not be able to see Mason at all. Well, in the previous arc, it is revealed that several Royal Moroy students <laughs> Gosh, that's a mouthful. Blech. We're practicing their compulsion skills out of fear for potential political changes in which the royals wouldn't benefit as much from the system as before. This group of students practiced these abilities on the outskirts of the academy and on top of the protective wards around the school. These wards are created using the four elements of magic and the Moroi using all their skills at one time on top of these wards essentially canceled them out. Weak wards equals random ghost appearances for Rose. More importantly, weak wards means that there's a bigger possibility of Strigoi infiltration. And it just so happens that on this particular night, they're about to stage a full frontal assault against the campus. Yeah, not good. Not good at all. It's from this point forward that the plot does not stop. Everything happens. No one is safe, and this entire arc is stressful. That's all I could really say about it. To explain much more would lead into major spoilers, 
but let's just say that the foreshadowing is the heaviest at this point in the story. While the ending didn't completely break me like I thought it would, oh, you better believe it hurt. Oh, it hurt bad. By the end of this story, Rose has gone through so much. She has gone through a full character arc where she is forced to confront her grief over Mason, feelings for Dimitri, and resentment toward Lisa. During the course of this final section, we are treated to moments where hope springs up only for it to get smashed into the dust. Even though this story hints at what's coming as early as chapter one, the way Rochelle Mead delivers on those hints is both painful and satisfying. Once more, Shadow Kiss has changed the entire dynamic of this story. Book one was an easy breezy high school story full of mean girl antics, friendship, and a slice of romance. Book two was more about Rose's relationships and her struggling to make sense of them until she ran out of time to do so. And Shadow Kiss is about a grieving, frightened girl navigating her own shifting perspectives on life, death, and love. The Rose at the beginning of Shadow Kiss is a different person by the end, and that transformation, while tragic in so many ways, is relatable on a level I wouldn't have understood had I read this book in full back in May of 2020. At that time, I had never lost anyone before. Since then, not only did I lose one of my best friends, but my grandmother in January of this year. Whew. Due to these losses, uh, it took me a long time to come back to this book after I had stopped. But once I did, I was very happy because I feel like this story gave me a chance to kind of look at my own feelings from an onlooker's perspective rather than like really feel it. And that was very cathartic for me. I needed this story to kind of make peace with the losses. And watching Rose mature and struggle to maintain her strength was just really relatable. Even though this is a work of fiction set in a vampiric world of all things, there is an emphasis on human fragility that I appreciate seeing. The exploration of maturing through grief is also another thing that was just really powerful in this book. The world building, the mystery behind what was going on with Rose's ghost vision, the drama of all these different situations clashing together, the romance, the action. I just loved pretty much everything about this book. The only thing that kind of drove me crazy at points was just certain characters not using their brains. But that's barely a thought on my radar considering everything else. This book was just an exhilarating emotional roller coaster, even with the meandering. Shadow Kiss is brimming with intensity all the way through, especially toward the end. This book just had me on edge. I screamed out loud at parts. I almost cried at different points. My personal investment was through the roof and I was just stressed through the whole second half of the story and I loved every last second of it. And so yes, this review ended up boiling down to straight up gushing yet again. And <laughs> it's just crazy that like this series, even though it is from, oh gosh, what, when is this series from? Hold on, I need to look at it real quick. So unprofessional to do this while still recording, but I need to see the uh, copyright date. Let's see, uh, 2008, okay. <laughs> it's just a shock to my system that this series so far anyway has aged so well. And I'll be honest, I thought when I first started reading this series again last year, I thought that at some point I would just be like, oh, YA, here we go. But no, this series is, like it has many of the typical YA tropes, but they're always kind of flipped. I would definitely say that this series proves that if there is a particular trope that you don't like in fiction, and especially YA fiction, if you can find it where it's executed well, then it makes all the difference. And I feel like a lot of the typical tropes that are seen in YA are just, really executed well within these books because they're stretched out, they're placed in different books. It's it's just really good. That's all I can really say. It's just really good. And Shadow Kiss in particular was one of those books where I, I couldn't really tell where it was going until stuff was just kind of happening. And I was like, oh my gosh, no. <laughs> but I believe I have said enough. Thank you all for watching and for being patient with me in terms of this review. I know it took a really long time to get this out, but I'm thankful that it's finally done. <laughs>
And I'm also really glad that I can just enjoy this story again. This series has been such an emotional roller coaster in the best ways. And I've been enjoying it so much. And I hope that if you guys decide to check it out, that you will be able to enjoy it too. Even though I spoiled most of what happens <laughs> in the third book, I think. I mean, I didn't go into too much detail, but there was still spoilers. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. Thank you for watching. Please leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. And just thanks for being here and thanks for watching. And I appreciate you all. I love you all. Have a great day. Continue to stay strong. God bless you all. Bye-bye.